you for having me. I'm really, really happy to do this because it was one of my favourite things of being uh, sort of more senior in a law firm was actually working with the with the junior lawyers. So I'm Laura Brunnan. I was a M&A lawyer in the city for over 20 years. So I started at Salt May in the year 2000. I became a partner in 2011. Uh, and then last year I left private practice or big law private practice to set up my own business. Great, thanks Laura. And so could you tell us a little bit more about um, your background? Um, where did you study? Where, where, how did it all begin? Well, the thing is, if you look at my CV, it looks very typical, you know, that you lawyer type, because I, I went to Cambridge and then I went and did my training contract at Slaughter and May. But actually, if you sort of dig back further, um, I went to a state store co state comprehensive. I uh, grew up in a council house, uh, first in my family to do A levels, never mind university dad's a mechanic so I had a very sort of normal working class uh, um, background and at school it, you know I got to secondary school turned out I was actually not that you know not stupid and I had a couple of teachers that really believed in me and uh, pushed me to apply to Cambridge I also applied because my boyfriend applied <laughs> <It's> pathetic <laughs> um, and then I got in and he didn't um, so yeah, so I ended. I went to Cambridge. I was a complete. Oh my god! I mean, I hid away. I was so scared. I wasted my time there because I, I, I was really scared and not very good with people. Huge introvert. Got to the end of my degree. I thought, oh, what shall I do? I read history, by the way, not law. Uh, so I've got a history degree. Um, tried some of the, you know. Um, interviews with the investment banks that was ridiculous because I hadn't I the thing you need to understand is I was completely clueless and naive we're talking sort of 1997 uh so like the internet was really not what we have now uh really didn't know a lot about what was going on spoke to a friend who was going to law school he had a law degree and was going on to do the LPC and I thought oh, this sounds like a good idea so typical Laura, get an idea in my head and run with it. Got a loan out from Barclays, rocks up at law school and everyone's going, oh, yes, I've got my training contract at this place and that place. I'm like, everyone's got their training contracts already. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, anyway, applied, got turned down by Trevor Smith at my second interview. Uh, got very unhelpful feedback from them because you're always told to try and get feedback. Got the letter from them the day before my slaughters interview which basically said all the other candidates were better than you. Thanks, Trevor Smith. Helpful. Uh, and then, yeah, had my interview at Slaughter's and was myself and got got the job. I um, Fantastic. Yeah. I, I, one thing I'd say about that interview very quickly is I was very much myself because I didn't know to be anything else. So they asked me about my summer job. So I spent the summer, I spent summers working in a factory doing like night shift and long day shifts. And they sat there and I said, oh, you know, so Laurie, you know, tell us about this, tell us about your job. And I think they were expecting me to do the whole, well, you know, I, it was a valuable experience. I learned about teamwork and collaboration. And uh, I just sort of said, I hated it, but I needed a job and I needed the money and the work needed to be done. And I think they, quite, I think they found that quite refreshing. And that sort of set my path ever since. I, I'm very bad at not, being honest as you're going to find out <laughs> and that's what we're looking forward to in this session is is your honesty um so just a reminder to all of our audience please feel free to submit questions via the q a um we'd love to hear your questions although i have got some that are, are pre-prepared for for laura but i um, keen keen to hear more from you guys um Laura, you, you've had a very interesting career by the looks of, of your LinkedIn profile and also um, based on our conversation that we had earlier this week. Um, you started off at, at Slaughter's, but then moved to uh, a US firm. What, what were your reasons for, for moving and, and why did you move at that stage? <sighs> oh, Slaughter and May. I love Slaughter and May. I'd actually... I. I was there for nearly seven years and I left because I was stupid, to put it bluntly. Um, you've got to remember, this was like the mid 2000s. We were working our backsides off. I was working nearly 3000 billable hours a year, 
which was insane. Basically, I was, you know, I was doing one deal with New York, another one with South, you know, with South Korea. I was getting three hours sleep a night. I was very tired. Um, and the US firms were pouring in to the city at this point with a lot of cash. And so, you know, I got to the stage where I was like, why am I working like this? And I could get paid double somewhere else and work less. You know, that's the way my little brain worked at the po- at that time. Um, and anyway, so I went and interviewed with a load of US firms, got loads of offers, narrowed it down to two of them. And I sort of was a bit bowled over by K&E's glamour, shall we say. They took me to a funky bar. They had an office in the Gherkin. The pay was the highest. I think I almost doubled my pay overnight going there. But, you know, my gut feel, you know, I didn't go in my gut feeling. So the short answer is I left Slaughter's because I wanted more money for less work, but I didn't listen to my gut. And, you know, I spent, I, I learned a lot of K&E and, you know, I, I made some good friends and did some good work, but certainly then the, you know, I learned more about myself making that move in terms of what I enjoyed and what I didn't enjoy that I hadn't recognized when I was at Slaughter's, if that, if, if that makes yeah. sense. It's only once you don't have it, you're like, oh, I really miss that. And so then when I left K&E, I was there for two and a half years. When I left K&E, I think I sort of then spent the next time sort of trying to recapture what I'd had and enjoyed at, at Slaughter's. And if you could like distill down what it was about Slaughter's that, that really, you know, kind of kept you happy and that you really enjoyed, what, what would you say those elements were? Well, people were, and this is going to sound really, people were just decent generally. I mean, you had some of the odd, strange people, but generally there it was it wasn't backstabby. People were generally interested in you developing as a lawyer. Uh, the partners, I know, the partners were nice. I mean, there was the odd scary partner, but even they, once you sort of just treated them like a normal person and not some demigod, were were fine. Really, you didn't really get you know they they weren't nasty in the same way that you might come across it at, at, at other places I mean obviously again you're talking I and mean, I worked out it was 50, nearly it's 15 years ago since I was there um you know and someone I know who as an associate is now about to become the senior partner and I'm like how the hell did that happen how have I got that old so it's just I mean it's it's going to be different for everyone Jess you know it's the mix yeah. of the people and the environment and you know we did you know, we worked for interesting, exciting clients. We, I remember, you know, being, you know, one of my first multi all nighters was uh, acting for MS when they were fending off Philip Green. So Philip Green tried wow. to play MS and there was this big concerted effort to fend him off. And, you know, litigation were doing one thing, one part of the corporate department was selling MS money, we were buying per una. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, you know, I did the per una acquisition and we did that in a week. You know, we did months of work in a weekend um, and I missed a friend's wedding and my husband, my now husband, wasn't very happy. <laughs> um, Laura, when we spoke earlier in the week, you, you mentioned that you felt that you had quite a different personality um, to, to a lot of your kind of colleagues that you, you worked with, you, you said that on the kind of Myers-Briggs element, you said that you, you felt that you were quite, you know, kind of the opposite of what the stereotypical um, uh, lawyer may be. And we've had a question come in. Um, it says, I'm someone with a loud personality who has creative pursuits, who is an entertainer and who finds it hard to box themselves into the mold of a traditional corporate lawyer. One of my biggest fears is that I won't be able to flourish in my career because of these character traits. Do you have any thoughts on that or any tips well, on, I suppose, on how they could overcome that? Well, what, what you know, there are always, always people with big, you know, we're not all quiet pen pushers. You know, you, you know, some of the biggest personalities in law are, you know, are, are corporate lawyers or what, what, what have you. And that, there's nothing wrong with having a big personality, if, if, if that makes sense. Um, it's just, you know, you, you need to sort of use a bit of judgment of when to bring that side of yourself out and when not. I mean, I don't know that I always use, you know, I'm sure I brought that side of myself out in times when I possibly shouldn't have done. But then, you know, I remember when I joined Reed Smith and I, you know, I made a big effort and this was 
five years ago. Oh, I can't I lose track of time now. Okay. But I made a big effort going around and having coffees with partners and getting to know people and getting myself known across the firm, both in London and elsewhere. You know, and someone said to me, you know, you're one of the most well-known laterals we've had because I just made that effort. And I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'm answering the question as such, but we're not all quiet sitting there drafting our documents. You know, there are some very big personalities in law. So honestly, I would just say, don't worry about that, but just be a bit mindful about when you sort of, you know, bring that side of yourself out and when you sort of actually think maybe now's the right time to rein it in, right? Yeah. You know, if you're in a client meeting, probably not best to start cracking the jokes. <laughs> until you know the client and then you get to know the client and you can develop that relationship um but you know, there's, there's a whole debate going on at the minute on linkedin i'm sure you a lot of you have seen it about you know what's professional what's not professional and you know people are talking about you know colored hair and tattoos and and all this sort of stuff you know i think i think there's a lot more space for people that aren't you know in the traditional mold um, and the other thing you know, I'd, I'd sort of comment on is that there's so many routes open now to people within yeah. the broader legal profession. It's not just about being at the big law firms. And when I started out, when I was a junior lawyer, it was all about becoming a partner in a city law firm. It was all very tunnel visioned. And if you didn't do that, you're a failure. You know, if you went in house, that's because you couldn't cut it you weren't good enough and that's just been blown out of the water in the last I don't know five ten years or so you know there's dinosaurs like me you know I'm I'm 46 this year I've been doing this for over you know 20 years and I'm only suddenly seeing the possibilities of how to practice law and deliver legal services outside of that traditional mold so you know there's lots of ways of doing it now um and don't box yourself in and don't repress that side of yourself find the place that will appreciate that I mean I'll be honest I'm sure there'll be firms that would be like oh don't, <laughs> yeah, well, you can't have that here, back here especially when you've got some of the old dinosaurs at the top which you know loved me as I'm sure you can imagine um but you know places are changing and you know the people are coming up through the ranks and changing the the culture and all, all that sort of stuff so honestly don't let that put you off and don't let it worry you too much just as I said just use your common sense and you mentioned earlier about um the the kind of it being a very tunnel visioned point back back when you started your career about it was partnership and nothing else yeah was there a, a particular point when you realized you really wanted to go for partnership or did you just always feel that you were on that track I think it was just always on that track so I when I decided to sort of do something a bit different which was about what are we February 22 so this is in November 2020 I started working with a business coach who was actually was a partner at Travis Smith and then Ropes and Gray and has changed track and we were exploring all of this and he sort of said to me he said Laura look you know you've just been on this you've just been on this treadmill this conveyor belt you know you've gone university law school training contract associate partner and then you've got there and you're like well what's next and he said you've never actually spent time to figure out what it is you enjoy doing or how you want to work you've just just gone you know what's next what's next what's next and without actually enjoying the view and I know that sounds really cheesy but it's like I was like I, I sort of like you're right you know what do I enjoy doing what am I good at what do I want to do for the next 20 years so but as I said, I don't think it's like that anymore. I mean, certainly at the last, uh, the firms I was a partner at, we had, you know, we had one associate who completely rejigged her, her personal life and moved because she decided she didn't want to be a lawyer anymore. She went to work for the Tate. She had to move flats and all sorts because her, uh, you know, her um, salary was obviously changing quite substantially. We have a lot of people go on secondment to clients and decide they like it so much that they're going to stay there or they come back to us and then go and find an in-house role because they find it more fulfilling and enjoyable. I don't think that as many people these days are driven purely by the financial side. And I know that's ironic saying that, given what we're seeing in the market with all the, the salaries. Yeah. <laughs> all I will say to you is that sort of salary is amazing. I know because I was on it 
uh, but it comes with it. You know, you're not getting that for nothing. You know, just so, you know, I talk to associates and they'll say, you know, they'll move to some of the US firms that, you know, obviously pay, you know, the super big bucks. And they say, I'm only going to do it for a year or two. I'm going to make some money and then I'm going to go do what I want to do. And then you catch up with them a year later. I'm going to do it for years. It's really easy to get suckered in and, you know, not think about, well, what else can I do? But some people love it, right? So the, my message would be just work out what, what what's important to you and what you enjoy. Yeah. Leading on from, from that point around, you know, kind of dealing with the, the hours, uh, someone has asked the question, how do you cope with the workload in the long term? Um, they would personally love to pursue a career in law in a law firm for 20 years, but they're afraid that their sleep, physical health, mental health or relationships may suffer. Do you, do you have any thoughts or advice for how you coped with it? Because you, you had a busy life with, with kids and, and being a partner. So, I mean, when I was doing the worst hours, I, uh, I was living with my boyfriend. Um, and he, I, I mean, I was just very lucky. I had a very supportive other half um, because they need to understand that there'll be times when you can't, again this all depends on where you are there's lots of firms that don't require you to do all nighters and weekends all the time there might just be pockets of it it also depends on your practice area I was corporate so there'll be times when it's all hands on deck and it's it's uh you know it's an emergency and you just got to do what's going to be done so how did I deal with it I mean I'm someone that likes their sleep um I just did it. I know that's not very helpful, but I had a supportive partner slash husband. Um, I was actually made up to partner when I was pregnant with my first child. And I'm going to, this is where I'm going to be honest. Okay. It was, it, it was hideous. I came back having had uh, six months maternity leave with my first son. I came back in the September, October, November, December, I was working on this big, billion multi-billion dollar transaction with the US yeah. I was getting home at one two three in the morning nearly every night me and my husband had a rotor <laughs> who was going to look after yeah. the baby in the night so I'd get home at two in the morning my husband's a doctor so he needs his sleep and I'd get in and he'd go right here's the baby I need to go get some sleep before I get up in four hours and so I'd get home so it was hard but you've got to remember like those early years with the baby they're not always going to be up all night um you need so the the short answer is you need good support networks um if you want yeah. I, I, does that help i mean it, it it's hard i was held up as some role model of being this working mother who you know was still well, i don't like to use the word normal because i'm probably not normal but you know was approachable and you know helpful and everything else but I mean, it's like it's like the swan, right? You just see this gliding on the top and underneath you're just like, going, oh. you know, there's all this talk about women in the workplace and making things better for working women or working mothers. And I'd always say we're asking the wrong question. It's not yeah. about making things better for me as a mother. It's about making things better for everyone. Yeah. There's lots of blokes that want to take time off to be with their kids. And it's, it's about making a difference for everyone. So, you know, I think you're wise... To, to, to the question you're wise to be aware of what some of the pitfalls are but you know choose your practice area and your firm wisely it's not like that at every firm in every practice area right so transactional stuff is likely to be like that litigation might be like that from time to time when you've got a big case yeah. so choose you know you but you you know there are lots of lawyers and law firms out there that don't have that sort of mad intensity all the time does that help I think I think that does help. And I think I think the the elements from from my experience of, of, you know, working with junior lawyers, we've got quite a few questions that have come through on the, the Q&A from career changers who are coming into law at a later stage of life that, that have already got kids and, and things like that. And I know from recruiting oh. people like that, it is it is difficult. Um, and I think you for, from from my perspective, when I've recruited people, it's whether you're coming straight out of your university degree, out of another career, uh, no matter what your personal circumstances, you have to be super aware of the commitments that you're going to make. And sometimes the inflexible elements of the career that you're, you're going to be going into, 
but yeah. you know that's that's why we're having this kind of conversation isn't it we're, we're trying to show the, the realities of what it's like I mean it's totally possible I did it I was a partner for yeah. 10 years in exactly. M&A private equity uh, but I you know I had a good support network I paid for a nanny we also paid for a nanny so you know my na- you know my nanny would come in the morning and get the boys I've got two boys one's eight one turns 10 tomorrow so I've got to go sort out <laughs> his birthday after this um you know come would come in sort the boys out take them to school pick them up from school um as a partner it's a bit easier to say right I'm going home now I will work from home and I like to think that if you're working with reasonable people that it's easier for the associates to do that as well and it certainly should be it's certainly less hierarchical than when I started out 20 odd years ago I mean it feels like a much flatter structure than it than it used to I mean there is still an element but certainly more progressive firms will be you know we're all on the same side I mean for example Reed Smith didn't describe itself as a law firm with 1500 lawyers I think I'm getting the numbers right we're a firm of 3000 people Mm -hmm. because it it takes more than the lawyers to you know make the law firm work Um, one of the questions that's come through is, is around how your passion for law has changed or developed throughout your career. Okay. What, what do you think may have may have influenced any of the changes around your passions for, for the career? Well, so I first went into it because, as I said, uh, I actually wanted, I was interested in competition law because one of my special subjects in my history degree, don't yawn people, was the history of the, was the, history of the European Union up to the Maastricht okay. Treaty which was 1993. Um, and so I, I sort of went into it from a sort of thinking, oh, I'd be quite interested in competition law. I did my first seat in competition law and hated it. Um, did two seats in corporate, one abroad uh, in Hong Kong. I also did a seat in tax and I tried to qualify into tax. Okay. What I liked about tax as a trainee was it seemed very logical, right? You'd be asked a question, You'd have all your statutes and you, everything else. You worked your way through it like a little maze or not so little maze. And you pop out the other end with an answer. Right. And I quite I found that quite satisfying because I like answers. That's why I like crime friction, because you always find out who did it, why, when and how. Um, I was told I was too loud to be in tax. <laughs> so bear that in mind, person that talked about loud personality. <laughs> I was like, you're too loud to be in tax. Oh, thanks a lot. Um, so I qualified into corporate and actually I just you know I liked corporate I like solving if if you strip it all back I like solving problems and I like taking difficult things and breaking them down and making them easy um and so uh, you know as I got more as I got more senior I also discovered I really liked mentoring the the associates and the trainees it gave me a lot of personal satisfaction when you'd sort of, you know, help someone or you could see how they'd taken on, you know, what you suggested to them and you could see it in action and you could sort of see them blossom and you'd give them a bit of direction. You know, I was, I was always someone that associates felt they could come to and talk to about issues they were maybe having with other people. And sometimes they'd tell me who that person was or sometimes they wouldn't, but I'd sort of help them navigate it. I was almost like this agony aunt. Um, and I, I just really enjoyed being someone that can, it sounds really soppy, but I really liked helping people, both my clients and the oh. associates. So when I had this big rethink about uh, 16 months ago, I sort of tried to boil it down to what, what am I good at and what do I enjoy? And tried to, you know, I'm trying to build a business that focuses on all of that without all the, the noise of management and everything else, because you know, the, the problem with law firms, and I'm sure you've all heard this before, you know, as you rise up through the ranks, you get more responsibility and managing and, you know, partners become supervisors, but not everyone's cut out for that. And you're not, not everyone's taught or given proper support on how to do it. You know, just because you're a great lawyer doesn't mean you're good at teaching the associates or running the department or running the firm. So, you know, I think I, I having sort of stepped out of law firms and looked at other industries as, as part of putting my own business together, I feel like law firms have still got, you know, a long way to come in yeah. how they run things and do things. I mean, I'll give you an example. So this is I, I don't I don't I work with clients, obviously, 
and I did a term sheet for someone and you know they're not used to working with lawyers so much so I thought well how can I make this easier for them rather than just sending them this bit you know this document to read and wade through so I recorded a loom video for them so I don't know if you guys know what a loom video is but it's like this little app you can get on the computer and you can record your screen and okay. your voice or the screen and you in a little bubble in the corner and so I did them a little loom video talking them through the term sheet because I thought that's going to be more user friendly than an email one client absolutely loved it Two, I talked about it on LinkedIn and everyone went bananas. They're like, oh my God, this is a great idea. And I'm like, I'm sure we're about 15 years behind everybody. Else. You know, but it's it feels to me like there's so much opportunity to sort of change how we practice law and deliver services to clients. I mean, I put something out on my uh, LinkedIn yesterday about something I shared with a client I'm thinking of doing. And again, they went, you know, my clients, like, oh my God, this is amazing. This could be really disruptive. And it's nothing that's actually that out there, but sort of trying to take best practices and ideas from other industries and apply it to the legal industry. I and mean, I don't know if you guys are aware, you probably are, but um, you know, legal services and the provision of legal services were deregulated a couple of years ago. I think it was at the back end of 2019. So before, in order to sort of you know, deliver legal services, in, in the way I do now, I would have had to have done it out of the shell of a law firm. I'd have had to have set up a law firm. I'd have to have been regulated by the SRA. Uh, and the firm would also have to have got SRA approved indemnity insurance, which is rather expensive. Yeah. Anyway, they deregulated it. And now, unless you, you provide certain services, which are called reserved activities, uh, someone like, I'm still a solicitor. But my, yeah. com I, I, my company is not regulated. And there's all this opportunity out there to do things differently. And, you know, no one cares I'm not a law firm at all. I feel like I've gone off on a tangent. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't worry. And I think it's also just really interesting to see the different ways in which you can work now. So, you know, the, the kind of almost like a freelancer base where you, you know, you kind of come in on projects for for there's, the various law firms in the city yeah. you know there's there's so many different ways of working and I think law firms from my perspective have, have evolved so much in the last yeah. probably <laughs> five, <laughs> five to seven years yeah. compared to the previous 15 years before that so I think it's a really exciting time to get into law. I, I think it is. I mean, you've got all of these, uh, you know, the, the platforms like Lawyers on Demand and Axiom and all of that, where you can go in and, as you say, either going to firms or clients on a project by project basis. I know a few people have done that. You can go to the virtual law firms, which is something I explored. So like Keystone or Gunner Cook, what have you. Um, where you sort of run your own little business, but they provide like, all the back office stuff. So they provide, you know, your IT and your marketing and your insurance and all that sort of stuff. But I decided, you know, with what I'm doing, I didn't need that. And I could just go out with my own voice and my own brand and my own business. And, you know, my actual monthly running costs of running my business are relatively low. Yeah. So, and, you know, there's, there's pluses and minuses of that because on the plus side, I'm in control of everything. On the downside, I'm in control of everything. So. Um, I just want to go back to kind of uh, working in a law firm because we've had quite a few questions from people who are probably either prospective trainees or current trainees yeah. asking about how to get the balance of, you know, kind of asking for work and, and ensuring yeah. that you're being proactive, but you know, kind of making sure that you're not going beyond your cap capacity or not burning out. Is, is there, do you have any advice for how you feel kind of trainees should manage their time effectively to, to make the most of the opportunities they may be given, yeah. um, but balance that with, with everything else they need to? Well, I suppose there's a couple of things. One is, you know, in terms of looking for opportunities, you know, make it, don't feel shy about going around and sort of going and saying hi to the other associates or the partners. You know, just knock on the door, say, have you got a couple of minutes? You know, I'd like to introduce myself or like to talk about work quickly. Most people are very open to that. If they're busy, they'll say no, but come back. Um, or, you know, try and take opportunities when associates or other fellow trainees are looking for help. 
right? So be a giver. I mean, what, some of the ways, the best teams I've worked in is where everyone pitches in and helps each other out. So you might be able to escape at five o'clock, but your fellow trainee is going to be there till, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night. If you sort of say, look, I'll give you a hand and you both get out at half seven, you've hopefully learned a bit. You've, you know, you've been part of the team and you, you start to get a reputation of being someone that's helpful and will you know, work for the team and not just for yourself. In terms of balancing it, it's not actually up to you to try and balance it, if that makes sense. So I would always say to people, you know, the trainees and the junior associates, you, you just won't have the full picture of what's going on in a particular, you know, I'll talk about transactions because that's what I'm, obviously I know. You, you, you know, you're not going to be seeing everything that's coming through from the client or the other departments. So you can't really try and manage. What you can do is you find, you know, you you talk to, normally you would have um, like uh, either a supervisor or someone that's responsible for you. And so I, what I, we would always encourage is you go and have a chat with that person if it felt like it's becoming too much and say, look, you know, I've got this work on and this work on and I, I can't do everything at once. And what will happen is, or what should happen is the more senior people say, look, don't worry, you know, we'll, I'll go and talk to that partner or that associate on that deal and we'll figure it out what we'll figure out who needs what you need to do when or we'll take something off you. So that's really how it should work, because you shouldn't be trying to firefight and manage your time if you're working on multiple things, because you just don't you can't see everything. And you need to talk to someone and get, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the more senior people running it to sort of um, triage who's going to do what. You know, and, and, you know, no one's going to think badly of you. Well, they certainly shouldn't. And it's, you know, things happen. Emer you know, a piece of work suddenly becomes more urgent or something, something urgent comes in that you weren't expecting. And it's, you know, there's a lot of juggling to do. So get someone to help you work out the priorities between different pieces of work. And do you feel that, that that kind of, you know, asking for help is is important more generally in your, in your career? Do you do you feel that there's an element that you, you always need to to have that element of being open to asking for support? Of course. I mean, one of the things yeah. I miss now I'm on my own is I've got no one to go and bounce ideas around. I, you know, even as a, you know, the partners, we always used to walk, you know, walk around to each other's offices and chat about things and ask for ideas or what should I do about this? Or, you know, not wh whatever level you are. And I would say, you know, if, it, if someone came to me and they've been trying to manage something by themselves when they were, you know, they were clearly not coping, uh, particularly if that something then goes wrong, I'd be more upset with them trying to do it by themselves than actually having come to me earlier and gone, look, I just can't do this. Can we sort this out? Or I don't know what to do about that. Because you can normally fix things. Yeah. Most things are fixable if you catch them earlier enough. So you just need to find a friendly ear to go and talk to. So what 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 we you know what I would hear on the grapevine is a lot of you know the trainees would go and you know they go and find the mid level or the senior associates to say, you know they wouldn't necessarily want to come to a partner or someone like me, which is fine, but they go and talk to an associate. Find someone that you can just talk to. We all help each other. No one can do everything by themselves and no one expects you to do everything by yourself or, um, or, you know, or fix everything by yourself. So, yes, definitely ask for help. The only thing that would um, go down not so well would be if, you know, the same issue kept cropping up all the time or the same mistake was made repeatedly or the same question kept being asked, because then that becomes a bit frustrating because you're, you're trying to help someone, but they're not helping themselves and we've had a few questions about kind of what makes a good trainee and and also uh elements around you know kind of what you feel put you on a on a partnership track and made you a successful partner um <laughs> it could are there other kind of common qualities or or aspects that you think either you've shown or your colleagues have shown that have, that are fundamental to success in a in a law firm um, at the junior end, getting involved, getting stuck in, helping. And as we talked about earlier, sometimes it's better not to be stand out rather than to stand out for the wrong things. 
So, you know, some of the things, the wrong things that people stood out for would be uh, posting, posting client stuff on Instagram. We had this. People put posted pictures of, of deal documents on their Instagram. Uh, just not being thoughtful about the team. You know, don't finish your piece of work, dump it on someone's desk and leave for the day, right? Find out, you know, hang around. Did, and also do FaceTime, but don't just do your work and then go because it might need to go out later that evening. So, you know, have a conversation with the person you've done it for. Try and find out deadlines. Try and keep to deadlines. If you can't, tell people, communicate, because we can find someone else to try and take it off you or deal with it. The worst thing, you know, from our perspective is having promised a client something and we get it and it's 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 not good enough. And so therefore someone else has got to spend time to fix it and it goes out late or it goes out wrong. You know, those are not great things. So that's one thing. Another thing is try again, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, but try and work with a variety of people. That is actually and I'm sure a lot of people say this because it, this is important because you know, you get to see working styles of, and things that you like, but also how not to do things, right? You're not going to be like that partner that makes everyone stay till midnight just for the sake of it. You're not going to be the person that dumps something on someone and tells them they've just got to stay and do it. You know, it will help you become a sort of more uh, compassionate senior lawyer as, as, you, as, you, as you progress. Do the small, boring things as well as you can, okay? Yeah. You might think doing some board minutes or something else is boring, and it can be. But, you know, I'll tell you something. If you do it wrong, that will show, and then you're not going to be trusted to do something more complicated. So do everything as well as you can and give it as much attention and priority as something that you think is more glamorous and exciting. You know, you, you need to do the boring stuff, to, so that you can understand it so that as you progress and go up the ladder and you're the one running the team or that part of the transaction you need to understand how it all works um and i know when you're in the, the well, i used to have to do really boring stuff right we used to have to um you know big documents you know this this fat to proofread them one of us would sit there reading it out loud and the other one would sit there with a pencil checking at least you know be thankful you don't have to do that anymore but you know we want to see good attention to everything yeah that and that's also one of the the i think the exciting things about working in law now is the way that technology mm. is getting rid of that administrative yeah workload that makes it yeah. more interesting and more exciting for trainees NQs at all levels it you know. totally frees up you know I'll give you another yeah. example when I started I sound so old and you could <laughs> go on company's house on the website click on a company and find all the filings and just like that we had to order the thing called microfiche, which was like giant film. You had to order it from company's house. It would be delivered to the law firm. And then you had to, and then you had to go down to the library and put it through the microfiche reader and sort of, you know, read it and write notes or whatever. It, it honestly, you know, I think the opportunities available now to get involved at a sort of more commercial level rather than just doing all the grunt work is, um, is, is, is amazing there's a there's a lot more to get involved in but at the end of the day sometimes there is some grunt work do it well um yeah. is what i would say because it, it it just makes a difference you will stand out for doing a good job your people will see you as a safe pair of hands another tip is to be proactive right if you get off a call maybe offer to do the you know say oh I, I i got good notes of that i'll do the notes of the call or i'll i'll put together the first draft of the email say it's setting out the action points i used to love it when i didn't have to sort of sit there and micromanage people or yeah. you know not so much when you're a trainee but maybe as you get a little bit more um senior you know you'll probably spot problems so when you go to talk to someone about it you know like the more senior associate or the partner don't only say, look, I found this issue. Uh, what do we do? See if you can come up with one or two ways of dealing with it. Because yeah. again, we'll love you for it because you've, again, you've showed that you're thinking about it. Um, what else? I mean, 
they, those are all very those are all sort of things that we all love is just being part yeah. of the team really helping not disappearing not um uh i think i told you the story earlier about someone that came to us on placement and used one of those electronic diffuser thingies and the whole corridor stank of <laughs> some very heady scent and uh yeah we had issues um with um uh, kind of getting the balance of being you know using your initiative and attempting work um i guess there can often be a lot of a kind of anxiety or worry about doing that particularly if you haven't done the task before yeah how do you balance kind of using your initiative and, and being proactive whilst kind of learning i guess on the job well if you've got any advice on that well as, you know as we we're talking earlier there's nothing wrong with saying to either you know it might not be the partner it might be the associate to say look you know i'd like to do this i haven't done it before what's your suggestion of the best place to start and even better would be to say i've gone on the intranet or i've gone on plc and i found this and this looks like the best way to start what do you think again just being tiny bit proactive and not just sitting there waiting to be spoon-fed what to do but don't spend you know if you if, if if you spend for i'd say spend five ten fifteen minutes doing that and if the answer isn't obvious go and ask someone because someone will know the answer quickly and they'll be able to point you in the right direction but if you spend several hours trying to flailing around trying to find out how to start something or what to do you're not doing yourself any favors and you know they'll be like what have you just spent the last four hours doing oh well, i was trying to figure out how to do this why didn't you come and ask me? I could have, you know, look, click, 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 click. It's here. So it's, I, th I think it's a balance of being proactive and asking for help when you need it. If, and again, that's a bit of a judgment call, but no one wants you spending hours trying to find out something. If, you know, it's something you could ask someone and they can give you the answer pretty quick. And they might say to you, no, I don't know either. And that's fine. And, and they may need you to then go off and, and exactly. research it thoroughly or, or do the work of your own accord, but at least you're being given that guidance and that, yeah. that kind of said, they'll, they'll, they'll be there'll be an intranet. They, they hope you know there'll either be an, you know, bigger law firms will have a whole section with things about precedence or how to do this or what have you. And most most places will have a subscription to practical law, which you know has a lots of precedence and know-how and articles. So just use a little bit of um yeah, go go and do a little bit of the work yourself before you ask, but don't spend ages. Okay. Um, we've had a question come in, and and this is a particular passion, uh, like passion point for me. So I'm I'm kind of being slightly <laughs> self indulgent here as well. But the question is, did you ever feel like coming from a socially mobile background affected you? Yeah. Um, this person has heard some stories that it can often make it harder to bring and work as a partner because you have less connections or a less impressive network. Um, and so, yeah, did have you ever kind of, I guess, been concerned around your background and how, how that may have been perceived or how it's affected your career? Um, I suppose I've always felt a little bit like a square peg in a round hole that I don't, certainly earlier on, I, fe I felt like, oh, I didn't really belong quite anywhere. I sort of didn't really belong with my family. I sound very different to my family in the way when I talk. Uh, but also, you know, certainly when I started, you know, lots of people were a bit posh, right? They were. I am going to a dinner and someone from one of these investment banks sitting there going, oh, so Laura, tell me what school you went to then. I mean, honestly, <laughs> luckily, I just sat there and said I went to X school. Have you heard of it? You know, so... What I would say about networks is I'm not sure that, that there are people that have got these huge networks from school or university that they tap into from their law firm. You build your networks really, in my view, having you know built my own and watched other people, you build it from once you start at the law firm. Remember, you're going to be working with people who will not all stay at the law firm. They might go to another law firm and then go in house. They might go in house or they might go abroad or so just sort of build your start building your network as soon as you can. Keep in touch with people, be interested in people. You never know who's going to end up where. Also, the city is, you know, if we're talking about the city and I know not everyone, this this doesn't necessarily apply to everyone, but 
generally the legal profession is small people talk so you know don't burn bridges either if you leave firms or you know there's someone you don't particularly get on with just sort of you know try and rise above it all because you don't know who's going to talk to who and you know try this is ironic because I hate networking but try and go to events go to external networking go to the network go to the events that are put on by the firm and something that's really good to do as a junior as well is, is volunteer. you know sometimes we'll be looking for people to help us run them so I I set up a, a social network for women private equity when I was at Reed Smith and you know always really appreciated the you know there were a couple of trainees that liked you know come along and help us you know help us with you know registering people at the event and so on and so forth and, you know but then you know I would remember that and think about that and you know that's a good way of getting in front of people as well is sort of helping out on non-fee earning stuff like BD related stuff and any good firm will want you to get involved with BD um, as soon as possible so one of the great you know one of the things I learned from K&E was you know they were very much you know build your network because you'll grow with these people and as they get more senior in their organizations they'll be able to give you work yeah. so I mean and the other thing you know so yes I did to answer the question yes I did feel it a little bit but you know I I managed to make connections with all sorts of people just 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 be I know it's just be yourself and you'll, you yeah. will find your people I and mean, don't tr I mean I did try and turn myself into someone I wasn't and I don't think it served me well sometimes because it's very stressful yeah I, I I I kind of resonate with that I I'm state school educated my first job in the city was with a magic circle firm <laughs> and and I know that it was probably just my accent that got me through through my interview at that time, uh, kind of nearly 20 years ago, rather than, uh, you know, kind of my education. But the thing that I will say is that I feel that the diversity of the profession has has improved so much, actually, in 20 years as well. Um, yes, it's still got a long way to go. It's, it's, it's I mean, got a I, long way to go. You know, I'd say look at the top still. Right. Yeah. I mean, I don't exactly. think the percentage of I don't know all the percentages for the different, but, you know, for, for example, women coming in, there's over half women coming in. Yeah. And then when you look at equity partnership, it's, it's, you know, it's below 20 percent. Yeah. But yes, I mean, I think generally it, it is better. And as people sort of, you know, come up through the pipeline, hopefully it will improve more. One, one thing I was going to say just you know talk touching on the point about building your network and you know social mobility and did it put me at a disadvantage you know that, that, that there's people the social mobility is is apply, you know coming up through all sorts of other industries as well so try not to make assumptions and it's hard but try i mean i need to take my own advice try not to have too much of a chip on your shoulder as well and if we're talking about you know imposter syndrome which you know, I I still get that. I you know, I'll see you know, I get I get um, people saying, you know, Laura, she's this powerhouse, or she you know, I mean, I won an award and everything, but I read my CV or you know what someone says about me, I'm like, who is that person? Is that really me? But yes, it is me. But I'm I'm still me as well. Um, I one trick that I use is I sort of you know think well you know I think of someone who comes across as sort of quite confident but not brash if that makes sense and I think well what would they do what would they say and I sort of try and model that behavior that's the first thing the second thing is let's turn it around if you've come from a social you know if you're you know the social mobility piece you probably have to work harder and I know there'll be people that will say no that's not true yes it is it is um, I know I had to do a lot more work for my A-levels because I had to do a lot of work by myself to get my A-levels to the level that was required. Um, I had to do a lot of self-study and, and all sorts. Um, you've worked hard. Why are you not any better than anyone else? You're as good, you know, we're all as good as each other. We're all people. I know that sounds cheesy, but well, it's but it's true though, and everyone's going to bring their own strengths and their own individuality to to an organisation yeah. and bring something different. And whether that's through your life experiences, your skill set, your 
passions, your interests. It's it's it, it's that element that of individuality that actually collectively make make a better workforce. We know that time and time again. Um, we've had a couple of questions around choosing practice areas um, mm. during your training contract. Yeah. Have you got any advice for how someone might try to work out which practice areas they might experience during their training contract or yeah. how you factor in kind of, you know, once you've done those seats, why, where you then may qualify into? Oh, my word. I mean, remember <laughs> this was me 20 years ago. People. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you've got to try and well there's a there's a few angles to look at it one is you know try not to make your decision too much about the people in that particular team at that time because yeah. teams change people move so really it's got to come down to the actual work that you're doing rather than the environment of that particular team or uh, that department because that can change and you're still left do it you know don't do work that you don't like because you want to work with that person because they're nice because they might bugger off somewhere else and then you're stranded. So really try and uh, look at what you enjoy doing separately from who you like working with, if that makes sense. Um, and also just think about, you know, you can do transactional work and have a, you know, you, you're going to always have a wonderful work-life balance. No but it's going to be like peaks and troughs. It shouldn't be like this the whole yeah. time. And, and just think about, you know, what do you like doing? You know, do you like, you know, it's, it's interesting. People talk about, you know, litigation is very adversarial and aggressive, but actually you end up doing more negotiation in transactional work. You know, I would have to spend a lot of time, you know, talking and negotiating with the other side and that that can get a bit adversarial so you've got to be sure of your arguments do you like doing the drafting and being across documents and coming up with creative solutions and not just you know you know so with corporate we have to come up with ideas or or how about okay you don't want to do that and you don't want to do that so how about we try this yeah. And then you've got to reflect that in the document and come up with a way of drafting it and piecing it all together. So do you like that? Or, you know, do you like something that's possibly, you know, a bit more cerebral like tax, you know, and that's, you know, that sometimes has the, the tough hours as well, but probably, you know, not in the same up and down way as something like corporate or IP or employment. Um, so when you're doing your seats, maybe try and make sure you get a, and I know it's hard because if you, I mean, and I think it's changing anyway with the SQE. Have I got that yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so just try and make sure you get to experience different, you know, something that's transactional, something that's, that's more, not book-based is the wrong word, but, you know, IP can be extremely technical, for example. Yeah. That can be a very technical area. So do you want to be more technical when you're sort of following the letter of the law? Um, and again, I'm still talking about law firms. They might, you know, that, that, that you know, there's litigation, or you might be wanting to go to a litigation boutique, um, or environment, or property. It's what what do you enjoy? What's interesting? What sort of clients do you want to work with? And yeah. just try and get a flavour of different things. Um, I mean, it's not impossible to change once you've qualified it is a bit harder but it, it does happen you know I know someone that was a finance lawyer that then retrained as an employment lawyer for example yeah and kind of taking that same element but thinking about it say, say you're a fortunate person who's either holding multiple offers for training contracts at the, <laughs> at the moment yeah. or or maybe you're a current trainee and you're being tapped up by recruiters for NQ roles Yep. Do you feel that there's any considerations or advice you can give people who are maybe trying to work out which law firm to choose from? It's all if you're trying to choose, it's always I think it's probably easier to move from a big firm to a smaller firm or from a more generalist firm to a more niche boutique firm than vice yeah. versa. Um, so, you know, if you really can't decide I would sort of probably go for the possibly go for the bigger firm just from a CV perspective. Then having said that, you know, some of the best people we recruited had come from smaller firms and because they got more work. So I think it depends on, you know, the people that you've talked to 
and what they tell you they are doing at the firm. Um, so that's one thing. The second thing is try. I notice. I notice is you're going to roll your eyes at me. Try and take. Well, it depends if it's important to you, but try and take the money piece out of it. Yeah. Because you know, I'd rather be happy earning less than unhappy earning more, and that's just me. Um, go with your gut. I know that's what I wish I'd done when I'd moved from slaughters. I didn't. I ignored my gut. I learned my lesson there. Um, you know, try and f try and get to meet as many people as you can. Um, certainly when I, you know, a, 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 a quite a few of the firms I was at, you know, when we partners had interviewed someone and liked them, we'd then get, you know, get the associates to sort of take them for a coffee or a lunch or something to sort of, and that's to sort of yes. a, give you an opportunity to, to meet us a bit more um, and give them an opportunity to sort of eye up associates as well. But I mean, the th frankly, if you've got more than one offer, you're going to be fine. Whatever you take, you're probably going to be fine. Yeah. And, you know, lots of people move firms after qualification. You know, we would get people coming to us from small firms, from bigger firms. And it, it's, you know, if, if you're in that fortunate position, try not to stress over it too much. Okay. Well, that's... Uh, uh, that's an one. <laughs> That's an hour that's gone incredibly quickly from my perspective. It feels like we've got, we haven't been chatting for that long at all. I'm, I'm very aware that there's a lot of people that have submitted questions, um, uh, both via the chat and the Q&A, that we haven't been able to cover today. I know that there's a few questions in there uh, more about the recruitment process um, and uh, for training contracts or vacation schemes. I'd really encourage those people to ask those questions on the TCLA forum um, and, and I can either respond or our, our wider community team can respond as well. Wait, how do we get hold of these questions? Because there's some, I, I'd love to answer some of these questions. You know, Laura, oh, has your honesty ever got you into trouble at work? <laughs> oh yeah, no, that was the one I did want to ask you actually. We, we ran out of time. So very quickly, Laura, has your honesty ever got you into trouble at work? Probably. I mean, I know I'd sit there in partner meetings and, uh, you know, we'd be do we'd be doing Groundhog Day about something that had been a problem for the last three years and everyone would be parroting the same old solution. I'd be sitting there going, we've said this before, we need to do something different. You need to stop X and Y doing Z. And, you know, you just see them going, oh, she's off again. So, yes, it probably did. But I could look myself in the mirror. I could look at myself in the mirror. And generally um, not that much trouble. If you had a no. if you had a long and successful career, Laura, you can't have got you into that much trouble. <laughs> no, there was another question. Have you found private equity MA as compared to strategic uh, general company MA type of work? That's a good question. So I'm, I want to answer that really quickly. Right. That's all right. Okay. So yeah. strategic general company MA, uh, you know, very risk averse because they've obviously got, you know, the listing rules and the city code and everything else, governance rules. And so I always used to liken it to, you know, they're, they're at the top of a gentle slope and you're trying to nudge them down the slope to do something. Private equity, certainly when I started, probably not so much now, you know, you're holding them by the ankles over the edge of the cliff, trying to drag them back up because they've leapt into something that's, you know, terrible. And you're like going, stop it, don't do it, no. So I think that was, a, that, you know, that was always my analogy of the difference. Um, and, you know, Slaughter's was very, certainly then, very black letter law, very proper. Caney, I learned a lot about being a much more commercial lawyer, taking a view, assessing the risks, not just going, well, that's a risk, that's a risk, that's a risk, Ugh, can't do anything. It'd be like, well, that's a risk technically, but so what? Who cares if that happens, you know? So, you know, I feel like I learned a lot both from the different types of work and the different law firms, but I mean, is there a way I could maybe answer some of these questions some other way or? Yeah, well, let me, I, I am going to, um, I'll wrap up the session, but what I will do is um, I will uh, see if we can get the, the questions uh, downloaded. Um, and maybe what we can do, Laura, is either we can record another session or we can find a way to, for you to respond to some of the questions. I think there's there's over 50 questions in total, just to warn you, both in the Q&A and the chat. But um, we've managed to cover some of them um, today, but we'll definitely try and respond to as, to as, uh, yeah. as many others as possible. I mean, I've just seen this one about boundaries. Good luck with that, is what I'll say. <laughs> 
Oh, we've, we've, had had you can say no. <laughs> we've had a request to record another session so um we we can always get some more time with you laura <laughs> well and you know guys i'd love some feedback i want to know if this was helpful or or not or what else you'd like to know because you know i want to sort of give you you know the best sort of advice i can give so yeah give me some feed send me some feed find me on linkedin and send me some feedback Amazing. Well, thank you, Laura, for your time this evening. We really appreciate it. We're getting lots of uh, lovely comments in the chat as I can as I'm as I'm talking. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. Um, as we mentioned, the recording of the session will be available to people um, as of next week. Um, and please do keep an eye out for uh, future seminars that we'll be running. We may have Laura back for another one. Um, but Laura's we'll taking a quick screenshot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we will be looking to run more sessions both for current and prospective trainees but also for um, those who are in the earlier stages and, and currently applying for training contracts as well thank you so much everyone um, have a great evening and we look forward to it to having you at one of our future events bye see you next time <laughs>